Great. Thanks so much. Uh, okay, let's do that. All right. Yeah. So, guys, like, uh, I think uh, this is what I'm going to talk to you today. Like, uh, I did not have a big preparation for today because this is something which I've been doing on and off my daily breadwinner. So I thought, like, let me try some X tempo and share whatever I know about these technologies, what I'm advocating on. Uh, and this is what I'm going to talk today. So that's going to be on cloud Kubernetes services. I think probably you'd heard about cloud native services. You'll be wondering what cloud Kubernetes services. So I might give a little bit introduction about these stuff. And then the slides are here. So uh, the bit.ly link that you see below is where you, you see the slides from. So obviously, like, you can just grab the slides from there. It's open. And then you can just I have my email handles and other stuff. You can reach out to me as well. So and probably like I'll do a maybe a first 10 minutes of talk and then maybe five, five, 10 minutes of a short demo to see what I've actually spoken about. So that's going to be the the lightning talk or lightning demo, I should say, for today. Right. So and what I do, um, I work as a director for developer experience in Red Hat. Uh, what is developer experience is that I do developer advocacy and developer evangelism mixed together. Um, being okay, great, great. All right, so what I was talking to you uh, before we broke, right? I think uh, still like, so I think the break is a nice thing here because like I want to tell you guys again what I was talking. So when we started with monolithic application, will somebody of us uh, still do monolithic application? It's nothing wrong in that. And then when we started with four months of uh, application deployment into production, we want to move to every day, every week, every hour kind of stuff, right? That's what people like Amazon, Google and a lot of other people are doing on the line, right? They just do microservice deployment, hundreds of production deployments a day. So when you want to achieve that speed, right? Achieve that speed of every day, every week, every hour kind of deployment, and then microservices based architecture. So we need we need to have lots and lots of other properties, like your application should be resilient, your applications should be stable, your applications should be elastic, API driven, and lots of other things comes into picture, right? So that itself is a separate talk. It's not a a short talk probably I can do a one hour talk later. But when this things of keeps things coming in, right? Obviously we embrace cloud on that case, right? Okay, we just let's go to cloud. I'm not I'll not be able to have all these kind of elasticity and everything within each and every data center that I'm gonna have. So let me go to cloud. So when you go to cloud, we want we want something like which needs to sit on top of each cloud provider, right? That's where we, we embrace started to go into something like Kubernetes because we want to achieve something that's a level of transparency that we want so that like the intricacies of the underlying cloud platform is hidden and obviously an open source platform that gives you that. And that's exactly where Kubernetes fits into the picture. So Kubernetes says, okay, don't worry about what's your underlying platform. Set, set me up once and I'll take care of how to take care of deploying your application, doing resiliency and all of the stuff. We'll see a slide on what's the usual constraint with the DevOps kind of architecture that we face. Okay. All right, but why this challenge already came, right? So because like I said, I'm a Java guy, so I'm just throwing out a Java example here. So when I started development of my application, right? And then I do my application and then give it to production guys deployment. That'll be a series of production ops guys who will be doing a deployment. I have to technically write a document and then give it to them. Okay, this is a water example and these are the configuration files you have to do. This is a Maven command that you need to type and build the application and this is your deploy. And all I have to do is like I have done it in a Linux machine and then doing Java 1.6, for example, as I said here, and a web Tomcat 6.x server. And then I use certain sorts of JDBC drivers. And that's a Friday. And I do this and go back. Unfortunately, what happens when I come back on Monday, I see that application is deployed into production. Sad, obviously, right? Because the reason is that the guy like who deployed my application would have deployed in a different platform, would have deployed on a Windows and then using a WebLogic 10x server and then a different Linux kernel distribution or something like that. It gives you lots and lots of other problems, probably miss some configuration, all these things. That's exactly where the containers came into picture, right? We started with the containerization, right? When, when, when Docker initially came into picture, now we have a lot of other frameworks like Builder and Lipport. CRI is already formed, like the container uh, or thing, OCI, Open Container Initiative. So all these things are coming to open source and open standards, which are getting to CNCF, which is a body which is governing all these cloud native ecosystem. So we got all these stuff inside. So which now made that okay, now everybody's standard is like I, whatever application I do a deployment, it's going to be on cloud. Okay, I start with a cloud-based deployment, I build containers, I deploy containers, and I run containers. Okay, and that's what we need. And once we start containers, what happens like I cannot keep going running like how do I do Docker run each and every every uh, machine that I'm running going to run, right? I'm not I cannot do for all hundreds and hundreds of services that I'm going to do. So what to do? That's where we need a platform like oh, Kubernetes or something which is going to help me to run these Docker containers, right? In the way I want it to be running. 
Okay, so I'm just putting this this particular slide here. Right? This basically shows you that how do I run multiple containers? Once I start running multiple containers, I get into these kind of challenges, right? I will have a port conflict, obviously, and I also have some disk pressure, memory pressure on the machine which is running on them, and then I need to do a rolling update because I'm doing a microservices. I don't want service disruptions, and I also want to scale, right? As we talked earlier, I want to scale them. Okay. We have all these all these challenges come into picture when I do this, right? And for allowing us to maybe handle this, like what we have been doing earlier, even before platform like Kubernetes, we have been doing these things by doing at infrastructure level. I mean to say, like we are scaling the infrastructure, we never scale the application. But what we are trying to do right now is now I'm going to scale my application, do everything at the application level, and forgetting about infra level. Okay, and that's where a platform like kubernetes was important what i call kubernetes right now as an application orchestrator it's an application orchestrator that takes care of helping you to overcome these challenges which i put on on my screen right now right how do i update how do i run how the host in trouble host in trouble and i have to co-locate applications manage them on multiple loads everything should be done automated and somebody needs to take care of your replicas as well right how much uh, number of instances that you need to run okay but what's what's limited with uh, Kubernetes, right? With any open any open source platform, right? Obviously, with any open source platform you take, one of the things what happens is that the the, the open source platform keeps evolving a lot pretty quickly. And if you see um, open, I mean, Kubernetes at least, if I'm not wrong, they have a release at least every four to six weeks. Which means that if I'm taking, if I'm going to take this particular application and deploy it into production, then there's going to be lots of instability, right? Because like I cannot rely on patches every time. I cannot keep changing my production environment very frequently, like how I deploy my application. It's going to cause lots of instability. And that's where what Red Hat we did, as I told you earlier, like we joined hands with Google since the day Kubernetes was announced. And then we've been part of this entire Kubernetes journey. And then what we did is like we took out all the code thing and then do something called as Red Hat OpenShift, which is going to be an enterprise Kubernetes platform. OpenShift is nothing but enterprise Kubernetes, which means that this is ready for enterprise deployment. So any enterprise is a banking institution or a telco or you take anybody for that matter. So if they want to deploy a Kubernetes based application inside them, then this is what is going to do. Like they take OpenShift and then run OpenShift on their platform. And we also have also we do is like we take Kubernetes, make everything downstream and take all the changes that is there, make it enterprise ready. And we also release that as another upstream project called OKD. Open, so open, open shift Kubernetes distribution. If you can go check it out online, I have a resource links there. OKD is an open source version of Red Hat OpenShift, which means that it's a hardened Kubernetes which is released back again with enterprise ready features. And lots of features which we added as part of open source, which is the core mantra of Red Hat, right? So with, we added to OpenShift has been uh, also integrated as part of the new spec or new features or anything like that on top of the upstream Kubernetes platform. And that's a continuous contribution that Red Hat is been doing for this thing, right? You can even imagine like Red Hat OpenShift is next Linux in the revolution of the world, right? For what you're going to do is like this is going to be a de facto platform if people are going to think that I want to deploy Kubernetes inside an enterprise, all right? And this is a nice video. Like we'll show this a particular video. I think I, I think whenever you get time, you can just watch. This was something which we did in 2015, almost close to the time when when we announced that we are going to re-architecture the old, older OpenShift on top of Kubernetes, right? Which is going to be what we showed on the screen, and we showed to thousands and thousands of people on the keynote of the Red Hat demo that day, like where they are able to spin up containers on the fly. Each user in the participant keynote, they were able to launch their own containers. I think this is something which you want to, I think I have a YouTube link there. If you are interested, you can just go watch there, how we actually do that stuff as well, right? So as I told you earlier, I think this is what Kubernetes is. It, it's like a pod uh, where everything in Kubernetes is pod, which runs your containers, right? Which is basically used to take care of running your containers, all right? So uh, with that, I want to show you a quick demo before I say, um, I take questions uh, on these time because there's going to be a pretty quick talk on to get introduced to OpenShift and Kubernetes. And and if you are going to watch these videos, we have lots and lots of collections of videos and techno, I mean topics on all these things. We run a monthly webinars, workshops running around Kubernetes for people to learn Kubernetes from basics, including service mesh, serverless technologies, and all other stuff. You can just go uh, grab these links and register yourself to get all those the updates for you. We have all the videos uploaded on YouTube channel. Subscribe to that to get the latest and greatest of what's happening in the Kubernetes world. And then you can also follow us on these Twitter handles as well. 
And I'm going to leave it to lots of resources on the slides. I'll share that to Vishal. I think probably I'll take Vishal's help to post it back on the slide uh, whenever on the on the site, wherever you are. I have lots and lots of tutorials which you are continuously maintaining around Kubernetes. Quarkus is a new thing in Java world. And then Knative, Istio, and Tekton, right? And as I told earlier, so we run a Dev Nation show, so which is going to be have one Dev Nation day, which is coming on September 15th. But we also run monthly Dev Nation master courses. Uh, that's the links are there where you can go register yourself. Uh, which talks about wide spectrum of topics which we do, including Kubernetes is going to be a core of everything. And then we're also doing tech talks every fortnight, Thursday. At, I think it's uh, noonish Eastern. I think you can go follow the link to get the exact time zone specific time. So while we do the tech talks with the latest technologies, our engineers will talk to uh, people like telling that what's a niche is coming up in the technology world, in the open source technology world. Okay. The, those are the engineers who are working in the upstream uh, versions of the product which Red Hat actually has subscription to. All right. And also, like um, I've given lots of ebooks uh, downloads for you guys on this slide. You can just go grab these things, uh, whichever technology you're working on. You can learn them from there. That helps you to uh, improve your expertise on technology as well uh, that you can grab on. All right. So, with that, so what I want to show you a quick demo before I close. So, as I told earlier, uh, OpenShift. Is enterprise Kubernetes, right? But why you will be wondering, like, why I need something like enterprise Kubernetes, all right? To to say that, like, what I'm going to show you is like I have three different cloud platforms here, right? So one is running on Google, another one is Azure, another one is Amazon. Okay. I have deployed OpenShift on all these three three clouds. Okay, it's exactly same OpenShift, which is nothing but your enterprise Kubernetes platform. So you see uh, uh, OpenShift running here, you see OpenShift running here in Azure, you see an OpenShift running here in um, Amazon. Okay. What you get out of this is that so once you deploy a platform like this, okay, your Kubernetes enterprise Kubernetes platform on, on any of those cloud platforms, right? The developer, as you as a developer, you just need to learn how to deploy applications using OpenShift. I don't need to learn the obviously you need to learn a degree of the underlying platform. But if you are an application developer, you don't need to worry about that because I can go choose a platform, choose the follow the path. There is an installer which installs on the platform, give it the right credentials, and it's going to install OpenShift. At the end of the day, I'm going to deploy my OpenShift application on top of each of these platforms, which is going to remain exactly same. For example, I have three different OpenShift applications deployed here. And you look at this, these are all exactly same application, which is just a hello world application that I'm going to invoke right now. And then that's exactly running on these platforms. So for a user perspective, it's going to just get only these things. Okay. And also, like every image that is deployed on an enterprise OpenShift container platform are hardened. We need to say like they are security tested, make sure that there is no vulnerabilities there. Even if there is vulnerabilities, the patches are released very frequently as well, right? And also, like it also gives you what another uh, nice thing, right? I'm just going this is an application which I'm accessing. Which is a Kubernetes application which I'm accessing outside, obviously using an ingress. Um, but what you do is like when you have to set up a Kubernetes, a raw Kubernetes platform, uh, so you have to set up all other nice ingress things to do this thing. But OpenShift takes care of doing all the other stuff on the fly. So you don't need to worry about those things, how to do these ingress and how to do other stuff. It already gives you a new URL. The moment I deploy my application, there's a route which I need to create. Once a route is created, I get everything here. All right. So uh, let's let's make this what these are or you'll be wondering like you, you told about Kubernetes, but these pods are not running. So these are what a serverless pods are. OK, these are all serverless pods, which means that they are not in use right now, which means that they are automatically scaled to zero, saving your cloud cost. I think if you can read more about that on my book, I given more details about the everyday everyday use case at where you can apply serverless using Knative. And we have integrated that into OpenShift as well as OpenShift serverless platform where it can do all the stuff, right? So if you want to wake this up, I'm just going to say, uh, just invoke a message, hello, FOSS. Okay. The moment I say this and then hit this one, I think this one of the services is going to come up in a second. Maybe it takes, yeah, do you see this? Google is coming one because that's the closest one here. So that's going to come up and then serve your request and you should see, hello, Google, from the one message being delivered from GCE, which is Google Compute Engine Platform. Okay. And what I'm right now showing to you guys is a cloud burst. And what I'm going to do, do right now is that, now you understood that this is going to one platform, right? What if we want to invoke on all the server? I want to balance. Let's say I want to distribute my application and deploy it on multiple different clouds and make sure that my application works very well. Like for example, like I cannot go beyond uh, a certain extent of resources in um, Google. Then I have to use Azure. And same similar way, I cannot go beyond a certain extent in Azure. I want to use AWS. Okay. 
this is a this is a typical hybrid cloud thing that's what OpenShift is made of for if we in red hat we talk about hybrid cloud open hybrid cloud that's another thing which you're talking about right now i'm talking about a hybrid cloud where i'm deploying the same exact kubernetes enterprise kubernetes platform called openshift which is going to give you a unified developer experience all right so now i talked about the cost i say you are saying the cost here but also i'm making sure that my cost is also balanced across all the clouds because that's a typical way which every enterprise is deploying application today all right so how do i do this to do that to simulate that i'm just going to run a simple load script to make sure that it's, it's faster i'm just going to run a small load load on this particular thing so it's going to say that it, i'm going to go to multiple different platforms for now okay i'm just going to push this out here okay so i'm just going to go here i'm going to say okay let me go so now what happens the application will start to go a few requests will go to google that's the leftmost thing and a bunch of requests will go to uh, Azure because Google is full right now serving requests. So I'm going to balance that load or resources onto Azure so that my cost is balanced. Okay. And there's no waiting for the customers as well. Now, when you do this, you should see a bunch of requests coming here and we get a few more onto Azure. And uh, let's wait for some time. You'll see this graph getting updated for you to show that I have five GC process four messages out of six. And Azure should probably get two out of this. Okay. That's what my calculation is. So Azure is sitting in the United States, so probably it takes a bit of time to go come there. But the whole idea is that I'm bursting from one cloud to another cloud, right? I've just kept those windows just beside each other so that I can show you that it spills over from one thing to another thing to another, right? So now it's scaling up here. So probably um, Azure is scaling to give you the example here. And then now you should get one thing. You have got one part and then you should say two to Azure, right? That's what we did. So four was processed by Azure and one was processed by your thing. Now, as I talk to you guys right now, I'm just going to leave you on, on the eyes. You see that automatically Google scale down because there's no request going there. And obviously in a few seconds, you also see Azure is also scaling down because there's no request, which means that as a as an enterprise customer, as a, a customer, I'm going to save lots and lots of cloud cost. Either take this cost, put it in something else or save the cost and put it for other operations or end of the day, save money. Okay save resources this is what i call as app resource optimization this is not cloud resource by virtue of saving the cost on the cloud i'm also achieving achieving the app resource optimization as well okay so one last thing before i close is that let's go and give this uh, request to all the clouds i'm just going to say link is a little bit load i think this is not a big load but just to simulate because it's easy for me to count the numbers there so you should see like a fair bit of going to uh, maybe five requests going to Google and then maybe two to Azure and then one to AWS. It will now go to AWS right now because that's the last in the chain which I have connected right now, which means that I'm going I'm able to go to all the clouds to balance my load. Okay, this is not just load and this is a Kubernetes application balancing. And now you see Azure coming up, AWS coming up and then Google, everybody's coming up and then I'm balancing the load across all these cloud platforms. You see that I got one in AWS. 10 in GCP, which is process five requests. And Azure is probably my slowest one, but that's okay because it's very far away. And that's going to for maybe take two more requests or three more requests, right? That's going to follow process that and AWS takes one, which means that from end user perspective, I'm again assessing like you take Kubernetes, which is an open source platform, but an open source ecosystem, it also becomes super critical that somebody like a company like Red Hat or anybody constantly contributes to the upstream well which means that this product are maintained and made ready for enterprise world. OK, that's what we are doing that by taking open source to the enterprise world. When you want to take something to the enterprise world, we want the application to be of uh, that quality as well, which means that we are giving the flavor or polishing on top of whatever is required on open source and taking them back to the uh, enterprise world so that they can also have this. OK, if you want to try this uh, open open shift thing, I think I'm going to I think I will post the links on the chat. You can just go try that out there learn more about what's open shift and all these stuff and where is open source variant of the same thing the upstream variant of this is also available I'm, i was showing you the 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 same similar variant for this as well okay i hope like this this made some sense like i was able to say like why kubernetes and why open shift and how cloud is going to get this and what i mean by cloud kubernetes services right that's what i shown to you as a demonstration as well I think um, that's pretty much I have for the day. So I'll give it back to Vishal to see if we have any questions. Uh, and let's yeah. see, uh, I can take some questions as well. Yeah, hi, um, thank you for the talk. So we have a few questions. Uh, so one is, uh, how does one get started with learning Kubernetes? So that's a learning. Okay. 
So I have I have a bunch of uh, tutorials on the links. I think Vishal, I think I'll post this link uh, to you on the chat. Maybe you can share with the participants. Uh, I'm not sure what's the right channel. I think uh, I'm going to grab this yeah. link for you guys. Uh, if you if yeah. you see the resources link, uh, I'm just putting that on the chat to you, Vishal. So if you share this yeah, slide sure. with the uh, with the participants, uh, I have a resources slide there uh, which has all the links to the tutorials that we build and maintain. Uh, or around Kubernetes, or starting from basics of Kubernetes, elementary, advanced, and then few other things like what I showed right now, like serverless, service mesh, Tecton, which is going to be your uh, pipelines and all of that stuff. It has everything there. You can just join that to learn more about that self. And I'm also putting another link on the chat, learn.openshift.com. So that's where you get your own uh, OpenShift cluster. Uh, probably I misspelled it. Uh, yes, learn.openshift.com. So this gives you this gives your own cluster in a second fraction of seconds uh, and then it has a restrictions beside where you can learn each and everything that we teach okay so that's also possible you can just learn from learn.openshift.com as well so these are the these are the uh, resources which are trusted and obviously you can go to the uh, link i have also ebook links are available there you can just grab grab those ebooks as well for you to learn yeah cool uh, so next question uh uh, Kubernetes promotes a user cloud. Is this the, is this the idea of uh, new devs to learn? Uh, it it feels like a corporate agenda to make all devs dependent on mega clouds. Mm, so I did not get the question right. Uh, Vishal, can you can you repeat it again? Yeah, uh, Kubernetes promotes a user cloud. Uh, okay. Is this the idea of new devs uh, developers to learn, uh, or uh, it? feels like a corporate agenda to make all developers independent on mega cloud. Actually, see, see uh, that's what I showed when I was showing you uh, the OpenShift console end of the day. Obviously, Kubernetes is made for cloud. So uh, it's also not, it's part of a corporate agenda for principal reasons being how do I save costs, right? So uh, because a lot of times like people use resources and go off, especially if you're working on a, some confidential data, then the organization want to maintain some control on where the data lands on. Okay, that's where they start with all these cloud-based environments. And obviously, with with platforms like OpenShift, like what we're trying to make, that we are we are making the developers unlearn lots of things which is not required for them. Right? Maybe if the developers, if their particular developers track is just to build the applications, probably we we'll just give him what is needs to learn. That's what OpenShift does. End of the day, it's again a Kubernetes platform. It runs on a cloud, so all, all those things are hidden for you. Right? And this goes to another uh, uh, step, what we call as like getting into uh, production or pretty getting into writing code on day one, right? I, this is what I usually call in my other talks as well. So whenever you, whenever I, and I was a developer like a few years back, lots of years back, in fact. So when I started, when I started doing those things, uh, I have to wait at least for a month and a month and a half to get my machine ready and everything ready before I start coding my first line of code. That's how it happened. But nowadays, like the organizations hire you to start coding from the day one. They say you get your badge. The day one you get your badge, you need to start coding. And if you're not on a platform like cloud, then it's impossible to achieve that thing. And platform like OpenShift and Kubernetes, what they basically do is like they throw you the development environment on the day one so that I can start coding from day one. I don't need to worry about how to set up my application server, how to set up my uh, libraries, what is required, what is required, because everything is dockerized. Just run Docker commands, containerize, push it and do it. That's it. Uh, does answer your question? Yeah, Vishal is on mute. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so there was a bit, you know, typo mistake. So the question was, is this ideal to, you know, for uh, learn to this to new developers actually? So like, should new dev learn this or like? I recommend that's the, that's the way the old world is going right now. The, at least the technology world right now, which is going usually the technology world is a sinusoidal curve, right? And now the hype as everything's happened, like Kubernetes went to hype and everybody is adopting Kubernetes based application. That's going to be a de facto thing, which people think like when you're in cloud, okay, you are running a Kubernetes platform. That's it. That's the assumption people are having. And obviously like, uh, I should say that the day when I, five years back, when I started to learn Kubernetes, I was put into a literal production application where I had a lot of trouble learning because there was very less resources to learn stuff. 
but right now there are lots and lots of resources obviously i given few things on the chat and then my slides has few resources for you obviously you can reach out to me if you have questions also i'll be happy to help your learning process as well yeah um, so yeah i think this was pretty much the question thank you uh, thank you for joining us kamish so no it's thanks. my pleasure vishal i think it's 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 good that you guys are doing uh, nice stuff as well uh, i love to see that uh, more things come up uh, as soon as possible okay i i'll, I'll hope to see you all in person next year 100% right yeah <laughs> thank you thank you <laughs> thank you so much take have, care and have a fun uh, yeah have a fun hackathon and then uh, let me know vishal if you need if anybody is asking for any help just please do let me know i'll be happy to uh, sure. help you sure 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 thing okay yeah. okay thank then thank you guys take care stay safe uh, bye bye have a great weekend bye bye yeah